Welcome again for those who are returning and uh, those who are coming for the first time to this uh, mini uh, IAP session. Uh, this is the final one. And um, last week we had um, uh, Yarden who spoke, uh, gave a great presentation on uh, artificial intelligence and its connection to the military industrial complex and so forth. <coughs> so. I'm glad Yarden came, so if there are questions that uh, you didn't get a chance to ask him then, you can ask him today probably. Um, I have lots of slides. When I messed up this thing, you saw I'm flipping through all the slides, so don't be intimidated. A uh, lot of these are Pentagon-type slides, so they have just pictures, and uh, so I can uh, <laughs> sk skip through them. Uh, <clears throat> so today, uh, um, f we are going to talk about uh, about primarily focusing on this uh, incredible waste of taxpayer money and sometimes outright fraud within the defense research and development uh, uh, enterprise. It's a huge enterprise, and people don't people know very little about it. And um, people, uh, first of all, people don't realize how much we spend on overall on our defense. Eight hundred thirty-three billion. Um, and by some estimate, it's actually close to a trillion dollar. And um, on within the defense budget, there is this uh, now over hundred billion dollar for research and development of new weapon systems. And uh, that's where a lot of the um, waste and fraud happens, but it is very important to understand that uh, there is also a huge connection between defense science and universities where we do the research. Universities like MIT, like Johns Hopkins, UCLA, uh, <clears throat> Carnegie Mellon, you name it. Every top 10 university, top 20 university gets large amounts of money from uh, uh, Pentagon. So there's a direct connection of and responsibility of scientists, engineers, professors who work in these institutions uh, to their contribution to this incredible waste, unnecessary weapons. And with those unnecessary weapons, we also create a lot of instability in the world because once you build the weapons, you've got to use them. And uh, because it is the, uh, and you use them, then you replenish the inventory, you make money, you replenish the inventory again, so you just dump them wherever you can since you have built them. Now you gotta use them and make money. So lots and lots of money, and so the focus is primarily that, not so much on the science itself or even the universities, but just at the outset, I'm saying that that we are at a university setting and that we really should realize the role of the universities in this whole business of, um, um, uh, there was some student who was supposed to come today, the uh, organization called Democratize MIT. Um, may, maybe they'll show up. Uh, they want to make an announcement, okay. <clears throat> hmm? um, may I ask a question? Oh, sure. Um, because you mentioned the numbers of the, the military budget, right? I wonder if you could at some point, maybe now, break it out a little more specifically in terms of, I know the recent National Defense Authorization Act, as it's called, NDAA, right. was 738 733, correct, dollars. 33, right, yeah. And, and 186. I presented all that data in the first the class, first in the first time, and also a little bit on the second time, and again I'll repeat them this time. What, I'm in, what, I'm, what I'd like to know at some point is, does that include, what is not included in that number that c can be legitimately considered part of the military budget? For example, energy department, right. um, veterans affairs, yes. and also is the so-called black budget for the so-called intelligence? Yeah, I think the black budget is in there, but um, the there is this uh, uh, work that was done by a relatively mainstream type uh, organization called um, CSBA. I think it stands for, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's a Washington outfit and they do the budgetary analysis. And this guy who did this work some years ago uh, showed the actual 
composition of what could be cons um, uh, uh, considered as national security spending, and that's pushing one trillion dollar when you when you take all of these into account. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the, uh, 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 James brought up the issue of the budget numbers, and that's what we discussed uh, in the first class. And um, we also mentioned that um, what, uh, in terms of a little bit of a hi historical perspective on where we are now and how we have come here, one has to really look back not too far, but only to the Second World War and to the Manhattan Project when, when, uh, when we really started this close connection between the science and the military through both the uh, 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 developing systems, uh, radar systems, and then of course the uh, uh, nuclear weapon in the Manhattan Project. And that led to the growth, uh, in my view, and, uh, uh, and, and President Eisenhower uh, 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 talked about this, is uh, the so-called military industrial complex. So one of the things I want to point out that we, I don't know if I made it clear, that what happened during the Second World War is, of course, everybody was involved in the war effort. Here at MIT, we had the radar lab, we had the electronics lab, and now that has become the Lincoln, Lincoln lab and then the Draper lab, etc. And uh, that uh, there was a, uh, a genuine uh, uh, patriotism to work in the Second World War to defeat fascism. So there was no question that this was a, a terrific thing to do. And, and many, many scientists who were later dissolutioned by the Manhattan Project went to work to build the atom bomb to, to, to beat um, Hitler's effort. Uh, at, after the Second World War, and uh, then the question uh, uh, came and, uh, as to how to sustain this newfound relationship and, um, and to fight the Cold War at the same time. So Vannevar Bush, uh, who was MIT Dean of Engineering, later on went to Washington to work for the Carnegie Foundation and then became a very, very um, uh, respected advisor to President Roosevelt. Uh, and, and he came up with this plan that it'll be a two-pronged strategy. One is <clears throat> to um, m m spend enormous amounts of money like we were spending at the time of the war, now in the peacetime, post-war, post continue to spend this money and primarily spend it on defense. So we have huge defense budget, and I showed last time, as to how this defense budget has actually just monotonically increased, even if you adjust it for inflation. It's not just dollars. The defense budget has not gone down. I mean, there are some local minimas and stuff like that, but it just keeps going up. And now it's up to $733 billion. And President Trump requested $716 billion in his president's request when the budget arrives uh, in, in, at Capitol Hill in January. And um, Congress, Democrats, Republicans, all, voted to plus up that budget by another $20 uh, billion or so. So now up to $733, $734, and then more. That's a nominal budget. So it's, it's not just Republicans. The Democrats, a large number of Democrats, are as much involved in keeping this juggernaut going forever. So in the post-World War, uh, Second World War strategy, is, is, a, is first huge spending on defense, military, so keep a lot of people employed and, and, and build a lot of weapons and systems and planes and so forth and sell them and make money. And also employ all the scientists who were employed during the war, now continue to be uh, employed, large number of contracts from the Pentagon all over the universities and so forth. And that certainly has tremendous impact on how we think about our social needs, how, what kind of research we do, and, and, and so forth. <clears throat> and that strategy was largely successful in a way. I mean, the economy hummed, and uh, we, of course, within the, the spending, even though we were spending on defense, there was still basic science. We did some very good work. And then uh, <clears throat> a lot of these, of course, built very, um, uh, very precise weapons, ammunitions, and so forth, but also 
produce things like the GPS, the internet, and, 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 and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, when this was going on in this, in this uh, paradigm, you have a situation where a large defense industry that's totally dependent on taxpayer money grew, became, uh, grew and grew and became very much influential in impacting our political system. And so we are now in this situation with Democrats, Republicans, nobody wants to stop this thing. Nobody wants to cut a single dollar off of the, of the defense budget. So we, we are going on and on like that. So I will focus primarily today on this waste. And then my, from my own uh, experience, having worked many, many years in the, as an engineer <clears throat> in uh, building high power lasers for uh, strategic defense initiative and so forth before getting totally dissolutioned and, uh, and leaving altogether engineering uh, and uh, how I became a whistleblower. So um, there is a, 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 an article I've just recently written for the IEEE, the Electrical Engineers uh, Association and their journal for social implications of technology. Um, it's, uh, it's on a list that's on uh, the RADIUS website and you can, uh, those who are from MIT or otherwise have access to a library or some subscription, you can just get it because it's on the IEEE Explore. That's their global system of collecting all papers that are published by IEEE. And you can access it through the MIT library system. If you don't have an access, then please, you can send me an, uh, PDF, um, uh, an email and I'll send you a PDF file. I cannot post the paper. Uh, because of copyright restrictions on, on, on that. And I have a bunch of copies here, so those who feel like they want it, then you can come and get it when, um, after this talk. Um, so uh, I just talked about the Cold War paradigm, uh, about the dual strategy, huge spending, and spending on, on R&D at the same time. So build the military, build the weapons, sell them uh, worldwide, make lots of money, and then also support science is no change. 30 years almost now after the end of the Cold War. So we defeated the Soviet Union. We have no peer competitor to speak of. Uh, of course, we cite China. And, uh, but the money has not stopped. In fact, the money has been the same level as it was at the height of the Cold War when in 1980s, when President Reagan started the Strategic Defense Initiative, which otherwise came to be known as the, as the Star Wars. And I was part of that and how wasteful it was, uh, I know personally. One of the things that I wanted to point out, uh, I won't be able to go into any kind of a depth on it, and is that during the Cold War, in the 50s and 60s, I mentioned that the, pr the technology that produced uh, tremendous weapons also produced things that changed our, our world completely like the internet or, or the GPS. So uh, that's true of the 50s and 60s. Now, there, I, there isn't that much data about it, but it is clear that while we continue to spend enormous amounts of money on, on, our, on our scientific research under the premises of national security, national defense, we are not, produce, we are not producing the same quality weapons or any uh, offshoot technology that is transforming the world. The paradigm has shifted. In the 50s and 60s, it was primarily defense department that paced the technology in fast electronics and so forth. And in the, in the, in, in, in the current situation, the technology is paced by in the, in the commercial sector. I mean, companies like Google and, and Microsoft and others are getting Defense Department money to work on their artificial intelligence and so forth, but they themselves are also spending lots of money producing technology that the Defense Department wants. So there is a, a change. So what is this money doing? Why aren't we getting any kind of a bang for the buck that the, it, it, it is just a tremendous amount of waste, and the people should really take a take a look at at, at this. <clears throat> and of course, we have we have pretty much gutted our infrastructure of first class research. 
uh, throughout the defense department and even outside. And we don't have Bell Labs, and Bell Labs is gone. We don't have all these great laboratories, David Sarnoff Lab in, in Princeton, or the GE Lab in Schenectady, or the Westinghouse Lab in Pittsburgh, or Harry Diamond Lab, uh, <coughs> which is Army Lab. The only lab that is left standing is the um, Oak Ridge, uh, sorry, the uh, Naval Research Laboratory in Washington that is still doing quality research, but everything else is gone. Air Force Geophysical Lab used to be here, the Hanscom is gone, they were taken out to go to Phillips in the um, Air Force Base in uh, Kirtland in New Mexico, and it's, a, it's in a, a terrible shape. Most people left, and uh, so we have a terrible situation, and there is an effect of that as well, of the hollowing out of the uh, um, uh, expertise, scientific expertise from within the government, which we had tremendously, is now really in very bad shape. And a direct effect of that, I would argue, is the crash of a uh, 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 Boeing 737 MAX. Because there is no in-house capability within the FAA. It's not just the DOD, FAA or NASA. And that all these people don't know what the contractor is doing. So they don't know. Whatever Boeing is telling them is they have to believe. In fact, sometimes Boeing for FAA is writing their own specs and then writing the report on their own specs that this is what they have satisfied. I mean, it is today, New York Times has a, has a pretty decent article about this, not this directly this problem, but how lax the <coughs> oversight of FAA was on, on Boeing. Because most of the time, it's all, I mean, I reviewed the ballistic missile defense program from within the government in very, uh, <coughs> in a lot of depth for, for many years. And uh, so this is exactly what I found, that the government doesn't, doesn't have the capacity to oversee the contractors. So it's a free-for-all. Yeah. If I may, the, uh, oh, yeah. the, it wasn't just that they didn't have the capacity, as, as I understand it. It was a, a, a political, a, a, a arguably a political decision to turn over regulation and maybe link to a lack of capacity. But they could have exercised more regulatory authority, but deferred, but made a choice to defer to Boeing to regulate themselves uh, on the on the. On the yeah, I think that uh, partially that I mean that those kinds of conflicts of interest, primarily from revolving door yeah. between Boeing and FAA and back and forth is going on. Same people work for FAA now work for Boeing, come back and so forth. And so for people who don't know, Ralph Nader's grand niece was on. Yes, one of those flights, yes, she was killed. Yeah, and his. Um, son-in-law, or not son-in-law, nephew-in-law, um, Michael Stumo, lives in Massachusetts, is one of the key, mem one of the members of the families who is leading that fight to, to, to get accountability. First of all, get, get an accurate understanding of yes. how these things happened and were allowed to happen, but then to get accountability. Right, absolutely. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I was just, there was a question over here. Oh, like, okay. <laughs> ah. re regarding the government labs, right. um, where does... Where do Sandia, Livermore, and, and Los Alamos fit into what you're saying? Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> when I was on, on the House Armed Services Committee uh, uh, staff, uh, one of my portfolios was uh, oversight of uh, Livermore and, and Los Alamos. I didn't have a Q clearance, so at that time I, I, I couldn't go into the nuclear weapon direct design matters, but overall I could see what was going on in the laboratories. There is no difference, really, and this is the lobby, so the New Mexico lobby, it used to be Pete Domenici, who was a very famous senator from New Mexico, who would be taking care of uh, Los Alamos and Sandia, and, uh, and then in, in Al Gore in Tennessee would take care of that, and uh, so you have these very senior people taking care of these labs, I mean, Los Alamos, after the end of the Cold War, had no mission. I mean, we should have dismantled our nuclear weapons and urge and, and, and get a treaty with the Soviet Union so to get down to the uh, as low possible so that we don't design new weapons. But what happened was, well, we've got to keep all these people going. It's the same paradigm. You've got to keep all these very highly qualified uh, engineer scientists who work on supercomputers in Los Alamos and Livermore. You've got to keep them going. So you come up with all kinds of uh, uh, tricks. So you... you, 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 you 
make this huge program that will write codes that can do simulations without doing explosions. And then there was a lot of discussion about whether you could do subcritical experiments, supercritical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, the labs are extremely powerful in keeping because they have, uh, of course, tremendous scientific firepower, and as such, they give this raison d'etre to our congressmen, our senators, that you know we are putting money on science. It's a very powerful argument. When I was there, it's. And who who would be, who could be standing up and say, oh, I don't want to I don't want to put money on defense science. As long as you have the word science in it, it's everything goes. So it is it is very difficult. So I've been trying to demystify, especially in the case of defense science. It ain't science. It's garbage, and and and, and we are putting lots of money, uh, just throwing good money after bad all the time. Um, okay, uh, I'll take one more question after that. I got to go because there are a lot of slides. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so if you hold your questions a little bit, then I'll get through. So here, here we go, James. So this is the budget of the, not the defense budget. This is the R&D budget. Okay, so the blue part is, a, is the nominal R&D budget, which is here, the number is actually much smaller than it is, 66. 7.7, and this is not my chart, so I have to explain it, what the discrepancy is. This is from the AAAS, my uh, home organization, which sponsored me for my fellowship in Congress. Um, so they do this analysis in the, by, and come up with nice charts, so I don't have to do with my eyesight problems. I have difficulty, so they, I use their charts. But what I wanted to point out is just not particularly the numbers, but look at First, you look at the defense budget overall, 733 billion, and it takes over much more than half now of the so-called discretionary budget. That's the overall, 4.7 trillion is the US um, uh, federal spending per year, and of which we have close to 800, 800 billion in defense. And the rest are like for everybody else. Within that, uh, now you look at the research budget, where we put our money for scientific research, most of it's in the, in the military. And this number actually, I will show in the next chart, is not 67.7 on the blue if you see in the middle. It is actually 89 billion. And, uh, and I, I have the uh, numbers to show that. But we, don't, we cannot find money. There is a cost for wasting this kind of money. I mean, there are many impacts of this of this uh, of this waste um, uh, uh, war and peace of course a big thing but uh, in the, the waste of taxpayer money that doesn't produce good science we can't find money for climate research I mean you would think on things like this where we are facing an existential crisis of today it's not called out I mean yeah there's some money you know NSF some money and even DOD spent some money on climate research all told, and I raised this question recently on the AAAS uh, uh, list, asking if anybody has an information on how much this nation of ours spends money on climate research. Uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, has come up with some number, says over about 10 or $12 billion. So look at it, $100 billion in defense R&D for weapons and all kinds of garbage, and we cannot come up with uh, a, 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 a more than 10 billion for uh, for climate research, and even that we 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 are cutting. So there is a cost, and I also pointed out this huge two-pronged strategy of huge spending on defense and huge spending overall, and uh, is 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 showing how much this nation is in debt. The debt servicing is $479 billion a year. $479 billion just to pay the interest on debt. Can you imagine? But that's what is going on. And, and, but do you hear that discussed in the presidential um, campaign trail? N nothing. Nobody will ever discuss this stuff because the, nobody wants to drop the apple cart. Uh, so this is a little bit too detailed, but, uh, and this is for the American uh, Institute of Physics, AIP. They just did the analysis of the, uh, how the defense science budget 
R&D budget gets split up. So if you look at the last column, uh, not the percentage numbers, the, the, uh, the absolute numbers, is the total, it's called RDTNE, and the total for RDTNE is $105 billion. What the discrepancy is, the 67.6, that 67.7 uh, that you saw in the pie chart, and the difference between that and this is they put a lot of the defense so-called R&D money in the contingency for wars. So we have this so-called war budget that we don't show publicly as the uh, budget of the Pentagon because even Pentagon is embarrassed by this kind of budgets where our budget is four times that of all our adversaries combined uh, and, and so forth, and uh, which I showed in the first, uh, first class by, uh, by looking at some data from uh, NATO and CIPRI and so forth, that the real, real uh, comparison of U.S. war spending, NATO war spending, is four times that of China and, and, and Russia combined, the two real adversaries, if we think of them. As adversaries, but here, 105 billion dollar in R D T N E in the, and there is I will show why the waste is so big, and uh, so th there is another chart. You <coughs> uh, here, what they are showing is, and I was saying that the in the name of science, <laughs> so we we now have a budget that went up dramatically from last year on the R and D defense R and D, but while with the total budget went to 105 billion, as I showed last time, uh, the last chart, we are actually cutting the portions that do science. So the universities are actually getting a little hurt that our money is getting cut. So here is, for instance, basic research, which is primarily the fund that um, uh, uh, supports grad students and research on campus and so forth. That's being cut by 8.2%. And then there is the other uh, budget uh, that um, uh, on applied research, which is a little bit uh, higher than universities and done maybe in laboratories and so forth. And that budget is cut. The budget that has not been cut within the science uh, uh, purview is that of DARPA. And the so DARPA budget actually is dramatically high because they are doing uh, all kinds of things uh, that are supporting this new thinking on part of the Trump government of going to space, uh, creating a space force, uh, and bringing back uh, all these discredited weapon systems from the time when I was in the Star Wars program in the mid 80s to mid 90s. And many of those same people are back on the saddle, so to speak, at the Pentagon after 30 years. And they are just, this is their last chance to really go crazy and spend lots and lots of money on hypersonic weapons and autonomous systems and, 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 and things, of, things of that sort. So, uh, all right. This is the cartoon I made up just to, so that you can, you can capture the, the waste in the, within the defense spending. So here, uh, as I was just saying, there is some science part, which is the basic research and then applied research, and then starts the non-science part, is more engineering. But it's not even engineering in many cases. So if you look at the uh, $105 billion that I mentioned, R&D budget for this year, 2.6 billion is for basic research, which has the, the it's called 6.1, it's a budget item number. And then 6.2 is applied research is, is 6.1 billion. And then some prototyping, etc. 7.4. But the action is in this green uh, part where 89.2 billion goes to the budget item 6.4 and up, which were actually building gadgets and where that work is done is primarily in, in, the, in the defense contractors. So the universities are at the, at the bottom end with the red part, 
and they are feeding off of this 2.6 billion even though this money is much smaller compared to where the wasteful part is and, uh, and I'm sure within that uh, university research there's some very really good science is being done but the universities because they get quite a bit of money in the scheme of things MIT for instance 100 million dollar on campus research that are open and uh, supposedly open and then um, other universities uh, get similar amounts of money so they don't complain about this that they are the seed corns of these ideas which then germinate along the way from 6.2 to applied research to prototype building to system development testing and so forth and the money is in the system development and testing and what is happening is <clears throat> and the yellow triangle I put in that's where the production of the systems happen. That means once you have developed a system, could be an airplane, could be a boat, could be whatever, within this 6162636464, that amount of money, and then you, it, it graduates to production if it passes muster. That if it passes the, the, a, a very rigorous set of tests, and there are lots of problems now with these tests, we are completely, the test organizations within the military are losing lots of their independence. When I was there, and when I will talk about the missile defense program, its waste, then I will point out that this testing has been done away with. So the people have an absolute free for all and use this money within the so called R&D uh, uh, framework and build systems that don't work, like currently the, the, the missile defense systems that are being fielded that don't work. So um, the, uh, it used to be really that you have a tremendously uh, competitive and rigorous testing and if you don't succeed in the testing you have to go back to the uh, uh, drawing board, come back with your system, test it again until you pass the, those test criteria. Now you can graduate to uh, production where of course the corporations make a lot of money but even in the green area we are talking about not chump change we're talking about overall close to hundred billion dollars and you can make lots of profit and the, another good thing about R&D for companies for profit making is that you you face very little restrictions on how you spend the money whatever you spend you get it back from the government so so let's say some company start, gets a contract, $100 million contract, and then staffs up and got so many engineers, scientists, uh, t technicians, and so forth and so forth. And you can load up that contract totally unnecessarily because maybe your defense contractor has lots of employees who are, don't have other contracts to work on. So you just load them up on this contract. And every dollar that you spend that you can bill to the government you you can get you can get reimbursed it's called cost plus fixed fee cpff so cost whatever is cost on top of that you get a fee which is a profit could be seven percent eight percent sometimes even ten percent and so the company takes no risks whatsoever proposes something outlandish whatever get the program funded keep going totally don't succeed you, ha you are not penalized at all because you're doing it all in the name of R&D. And um, in the production phase, if you, have my, if you have graduated there, and as I was saying that we are seeing some decline on innovation, decline, of course, on the quality of, of systems that we are building, we didn't have this kind of problem in the 50s and 60s. I mean, on the, but now we have so many, and I will show you a chart that GAO, uh, the Government Accountability Office where I used to work, publish every year is a list of systems that are running into problem and they have a top 20 top 50 whatever every system every system runs into problem primarily with technology and and can't make the performance then go back and make the performance and keep doing it and spend money spend money spend money so the cost just is always growing much more than what you what the companies would say at the outset to the Pentagon uh, uh, when, when they start out. So uh, I will illustrate this in the, with uh, uh, three examples and um, I have to speed up uh, uh, because I want to have time for people to have a discussion at the end. Um, so um, 
uh, and uh, these are all from my personal experience. And as I was saying at the beginning of the class, I have this article that is published with IEEE. It's called uh, Price for Blowing the Whistle on Missile Defense. And it will be, it's available, the link is available on Radius. You can go and if you're an MIT person or some other person with a, with a library uh, access, you can get, get it online. If not, uh, please send me your email and I'll send you the PDF. And I have 15 or so copies here, so you can pick it up if you feel like. Uh, uh, doing that. So three programs I will talk about. Um, one is, um, uh, and these are uh, uh, reverse chronological order. Uh, um, um, I was at GAO having left engineering with the being disillusioned in the Star Wars business. So I was in Congress and I was in GAO and I was reviewing the ballistic missile uh, uh, defense program. And uh, um, and I found uh, uh, um, um, a fraud. The contracts of Boeing had lied, and um, and what happened to that? And um, and that's in the mid-course defense, the so-called GMD system. And then the second one was I mentioned this in the first class about the airborne laser. It's also a um, missile defense program. All of these are missile defense because I personally worked all these years primarily on on programs related to missile defense. And so uh, that's what my experience is. But as I said, GAO publishes a list of all these systems that run into trouble. So you can see them as well uh, if, if you have time or interest. And uh, so airborne laser, that was uh, when I was in the Congress as well. But directly, I was on the staff of the House Armed Services Committee when I was I was asked to review this program quickly for the members. And I went and uh, went to the uh, a uh, company that was making the laser, I found that this its technology was just nowhere near to be fielded, and I recommended that it, it just remain on R and D phase, and uh, uh, um, primarily doing laboratory tests of fundamental laser parameters, etc. Demonstrate them, and gradually then you can go on to build the system. But there's so much pressure from Boeing and Lockheed and all these; they went ahead and funded it. So this went ahead for like nine or ten years, about five billion was spent on the program until just the thing just fell apart. They couldn't deliver anything. And and the other one, if I have time, is my uh, actually during the SDI phase when I was working as a scientist engineer uh, building um, space-based type uh, lasers for uh, uh, the SDI and, um, and, and what happened there. So uh, let me... Um, so just to um, um, sort of, uh, for those who were not in the first class, the Star Wars Defense Program, SDI, was initiated by Reagan, President Reagan, and um, it was supposed to stop Soviet ICBMs with a missile shield. And the missile shield would be, would comprise lasers, um, kinetic interceptors, uh, they were also thinking of all other kinds of so-called directed energy weapons, microwaves, and, and so forth. <coughs> uh, electron beams, and you name it. Uh, X-ray. Uh, and this program started in 1983, the SDI, and it was stopped by President Bush Sr. in 1991 after the end of the Cold War. By that time, from 1983 to 1991, it already spent $100 billion. But the program didn't die. The power of these corporations and their, their supporters in Congress is so huge. So they kept the program alive during the um, uh, Bush years and the Clinton years. Uh, when I was there, Clinton years, uh, five billion a year, they were funding it until 2000. And when President George Bush got elected, took office in 2001, the funding just went right up from five billion to 12 billion. So from 2000, to now, and it's continuing, and it has had Obama years and so forth, nothing changed, 12 billion a year, and it is in the R&D. The program is still in the R&D, although it is supposedly deploying systems, which by their own protocols, you cannot do. You can test or something like that, but you cannot deploy systems or field them, as they say, uh, under the R&D rubric, because R&D is a little more loosey-goosey, so you can kind of get away with things that you wouldn't 
uh, when, before you go into production. So they don't want to go into production. They said, okay, we're happy with 12 billion. I mean, if we go into production, maybe we'll make 200 billion. But this thing is such a turkey that if you go into any kind of testing, it'll not pass. So might as well keep it there. Democrats, Republicans, all happy. Missile defense, just keep it going. So that, that's what is happening. So to this day, by my estimate, we have spent $300 billion on missile defense from 1983 to, to now. And, uh, uh, and now it's just $12 billion. So even though I found this issue going back to 1996, this thing is still alive and not so kicking, but spending money regardless. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the system. Uh, I will just show you. Uh, this is the Pentagon's picture, of course. They got all kinds of things. So on the left-hand side is the airplane. That's the airborne laser. That's a, that program is gone now. So this is an old old slide. I kept it just to show all the components they're trying to build for the missile defense. It's an incredible system, you know, to stop Soviet ICBM or now Russian ICBM, Iranian, whatever. And you need space-based um, sensors. You need ground-based radars. You need... Um, uh, interceptors that are ground-based, interceptors that are air, airborne, interceptors that, in, that are sea-based, seaborne, all these things. So one of the major part of the, of the program is the, in the middle, it is, um, uh, this is the mid-course defense. That is, these ICBMs are coming from Russia or China, their travel time is 30 minutes or whatever, and then as these missiles are coming, we want to intercept them with a so-called hit-to-kill system. And that's a, uh, si I I the f even the physics is, is very difficult. And that's where I found uh, the problem with the test. So the tests have not proved anything uh, other than that the first test failed. And then they changed. They said, well, you know, we, we don't uh, worry about the Russian or Chinese missiles. They're not going to attack us. The missiles that are going to attack us are like North Korea or, or Iran. And, and they don't have the capability of fooling us with uh, all kinds of other uh, things when the, their missiles fly. Now, if they can build an ICBM that carry a weapon that can travel 6,000 miles, I think they can do a few more things. So, but anyway, so the, uh, but what, what it allows us to do is to field systems that are not, not effective and yet make money for the corporation. So the GMD, Middle one, airborne laser on the uh, on the on the on the left hand side, and uh, and then there are some other lasers that are not seen as part of the SDI program. That's not here. Then if I have time, I'll go to that one. Um, so no realistic realistic testing. So I'm now talking about the GMD system, the ground based mid course. When the 30 minute missile flight time and in the exo atmosphere, uh, we are trying to intercept this with uh, our own interceptor. And a hit to kill system and it requires a key technology which is called uh, discrimination to differentiate between um, um, uh, the warhead that is uh, being launched that will not ideally but that would theoretically would have a nuclear weapon in the warhead and we want to intercept that so we have this hit to kill system but you need to distinguish the warhead from other decoy-like things that are very easy to make because in, in, in vacuum you don't have drag, so you can fly very lightweight decoys and you won't know which one is the warhead, which one is the decoy. So that's the key Achilles heel of this mid-course system. And uh, so on this one, what happened was uh, I was the technical leader of the review team that reviewed the allegations uh, by a woman named Nira Schwartz from um, uh, Hughes Aircraft, who were building the software to determine, to distinguish between the decoy and the warhead. This would be embedded processing on our interceptor as it is going towards the target. It is looking at it, gathering the infrared signatures and doing signal processing to try to find out which one is that. And, and the things that they had to demonstrate with this test is this just this sensor, nothing else. And it was not an intercept test. So they would launch a, uh, a simulated a target missile and we would launch the interceptor, they would fly by and take pictures basically on the infrared and we will do the, uh, the calculations. So um, what happened is 
is this is a picture of the um, uh, this is another pentagon picture of the target complex that the if you look at the right corner that sort of looks like what the warhead it is a um, 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 uh, it's made for re-entry and the shape is is, is 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 aerodynamic it's like that and then other decoys are just balloons could be heated could be unheated and mylar and things like that are used very so these are russian decoys that they have picture they have uh, we have gathered uh, intelligence information and then we build our own um, uh, decoys as well so all these target complexes coming at you, and one of them is a, is a warhead. So the testing is decoys technology is simple. So there's no reason why the North Koreans wouldn't be able to build it. This is uh, the um, um, interceptor launch pad. It's in the on the Marshall Islands. This is where this pay payload on the interceptor is the uh, is the is the sensor package that was supposed to fly anyway that's a separate story i won't have time to go into it but our interceptors are launched from the marshall island and uh, and this is the interceptor itself this is not the real interceptor but it's a picture and it's actually made by raytheon it's it it basically has that brass uh, portion which has the telescope and the uh, inter infrared uh, camera and uh, it's it's raytheon but the thing that happened was it was a boeing thing but it's very similar in, in, in design and construction. So what happened, we looked at the data. They, uh, the NIRA had complained that it didn't work. They had a test, a $100 million test, but it didn't work. So we went and looked at all the data, and it was primarily, um, uh, all, primarily secret data. So I had to spend enormous amounts of time in what's called SCIF, which is the a secret compartmentalized information facility and you basically have no communication no nothing and you go in and read these things you can't take out anything no computer no notebooks nothing so i spend enormous amounts of time looking at this data on the skiff and um and and pretty much came away after uh, discussions with boeing scientists that what happened was the the test had a problem and the infrared sensor had to be cooled to uh, a super cool temperature of 10 degrees Kelvin. So very, 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 very low. 10 degrees Kelvin, not Celsius. This is nearing absolute zero. And, and, and the whole business of designing this cooling system was fantastic engineering, but it unfortunately didn't work. So we didn't have the temperature of the uh, infrared sensor that had to be cooled. It had a hydrogen cube that was resting on the, on the backside of the sensor and the hydrogen cube just melted. So didn't have the, um, so the noise on the sensor and the electronic noise on the sensor was just incredibly high. So nothing can be uh, seen because uh, there was so much noise in the system. So no data was collected. End of story, should have been end of story. It didn't work. And there's not, nothing shame on it. But I mean, it's a scientific experiment. But the thing is, this program was so important, you couldn't say that it didn't work. Because then people like us in Congress would be jumping up and down and say, this program should not be funded at the level. So they come and do a nice computer simulation. Oh, it, it worked beautifully. And, uh, and, and so our, my finding was exactly the opposite. And the Boeing chief scientist agreed with me. What does I mean, FPA stand for? Focal plane array. That's uh, this. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, so, sorry. So the what happened is this is the punchline on that one is that GAO, my organization, they are the congressional watchdog. Their job is to oversee the so that the rest of the uh, agencies of government are operating properly, like the FAA, like DOD. Uh, you name it. And GAO came under a lot of pressure, and the management just caved. So here I was writing this report and sending it to Washington to the higher-ups in GAO who would edit and put it together. And, I, and the draft comes back. I haven't written this draft. There's something going on here. So they, of course, didn't want to say what happened. There was lots and lots of pressure. So it's very unfortunate. But... Um, so uh, I fought within GAO for years 
two years, three years, saying that you got to put a retraction on this report that you put out. That's not correct. And of course, they wouldn't do it. So, so I ended up going to pub going public, and uh, but going public has a terrible price. So, um, uh, I'll take just maybe five or six more minutes to go with the other one, the the airborne laser I was talking about. Uh, and these slides will be up, so you can. Uh, I'll send the slides to um, um, uh, Radius right away, so you can see them. Even though the video will take a little time, but you have the slides. So this is the airborne laser, another system that was going to stop Russian missiles on their track, so to speak. And this was in the boost phase. So the missile has a boost phase when the missile is actually powered by a <coughs> solid state or other liquid fuel engine. And uh, then the booster falls away and it keeps on a ballistic trajectory, keeps going to the target. So in the boost phase, it is actually easy to intercept because you have a, a, a very distinct, loud signature, so to speak, of the plume that's coming out of the rocket. As the as the as is boosting, you have a tremendous visible and infrared signature, so that can be visible from satellites, etc. We have very high power satellites uh, on both on the low Earth orbit and the geo to look at these uh, missiles. But this guy, the airborne laser, was very different. They said, no, 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 we don't have to do anything like it. This is going to be a completely autonomous system it will have its own detection system own radar doesn't need any queuing or anything it's all autonomous because it will have a weapon that will go at lightning speed so even though we can take some time to do this uh, once we fire the laser it's at lightning speed speed of light so it's gone in in, in, in seconds you, you're done in destroying the target well for that, you need the laser. So uh, all the other stuff you can make up in beautiful visionary videos. This is a Boeing video as an ABL vision. It's fantastic vision, yes. But I mean, the vision has to be based with some sort of reality. There was nothing. There was nothing. The laser didn't exist, practically, practically. I went out to see the laser at Kirtland, which is the Air Force Base in New Mexico where they were building this, uh, the program office was there. So I went out there, and uh, so I said, okay, I want to see the laser and uh, see some data. Oh, the laser is at the contractors. Been all been shipped. Uh, so I said, but maybe scientists, uh, airport scientists should be able to answer some question. Oh, no, no, you just ask the contractors. So I fly out to California. The same company, Hughes Aircraft, was building this laser as well. And this is a chemical laser. So they were building the laser, and they were making fancy drawings of supersonic flows of high, uh, uh, mixing uh, oxygen and, and iodine, and to make this oxygen iodine laser that would have a very short wavelength in infrared, and, and, and it's fantastic. It's megawatt class. I mean, it's put out megawatts of power. I mean, they haven't even demonstrated watts. I mean, you've got to, you've got to first, I mean, take baby steps. You got to crawl before you walk, and you got to walk before you run, and all it's no problem. We we just got this thing totally licked. We'll take care of it. Well, it didn't. So first, this is the airplane. Always Boeing the airplane was sold, so they bought the airplane right away. Seven four seven, two seven four seven. You know, I don't know how many million a copy, but and then on the on the the turret. They had to put this window for this laser to come out of the airplane. And that window itself is a tremendous technical challenge because if it is a megawatt type laser, the window, the quartz window is a major problem. We don't even have that kind of polishing ability in the United States anymore. Corning glass used to do those kinds of work. It's gone. So it's in, in Germany, uh, Bosch did uh, windows because it, it's a, extremely flat. Any kind of a nix in the glass, they, it'll just blow right up. Because it'll just, it's just the thermal instability will just, will just <laughs> blow up. Anyway, it, they never had to be tested for this kind of power. So they bought the window, but nothing happened. So this is the, the final problem was, is, is this airplane had Boeing 747 
had to accept all the laser sort of modules. It was a modular design. And they had a 14 modules to build. So these are smart engineers. But the 14 modules, when they calculated whatever the Hughes aircraft was telling them, this laser, one module would put out so many kilowatts, so 14 modules will put out so many megawatts or whatever. This is all fiction. This is just computer simulation and all this stuff. No data in, 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 in real life. So the 14 modules became so big that they could only fit six modules. We would cut the power of the laser dramatically. And these are classified numbers, so I, I, I don't even remember them. But dramatically, because one of the reasons you need the high power, because the laser beam has to travel long distance, 400 miles or so, that was the kind of thinking they were doing, as a standoff weapon. That means if you are attacking a, uh, a Russian missile on the boost phase, you don't want it close to Russia, so you want to be far away so you can attack it with lightning speed. But <clears throat> The beam, as it propagates in the atmosphere, also diffraction just blows it right up. So you need a lot of power to begin with to deliver enough power on target that can blow it up. So you don't have the power to begin with. What are you going to do? So I told them that we should have a laboratory demonstration out of one module, test it in the laboratory, show what one module can do, and then you can show us how that module could fit into the airplane. It turned out the one module was way too big because it just, the laser didn't have, so gone. So five years later, program is canceled. So <clears throat> nothing happened. And five, and, and I'm sorry, 10 years later. And 10 years ago, on the briefings that I attended, they were saying, this is a typical thing they would put up on a, on a slide. It will say, no showstoppers. There will be no showstoppers. We got all workarounds. We got problems, we got workarounds. Well, I mean, the real thing is that no matter what they are saying or doing, they're spending money all the time. We can't say, okay, they, you ain't got any showstopper, but, but if we find something, we stop the money. No, we can't stop the money. So anyway, so these are the stories, and I will skip the third story now, but um, on, the, on the other lasers that have multiple, multiple lasers that I worked on that went unfortunately nowhere. I will just end it by saying, well, so what, why am I doing all these things? Growing horse, talking about all these things. <laughs> That's, it is interesting that, um, it, I mean, we can't get through to the politicians yet. Sooner or later it'll happen, it may not be in my lifetime, but um, it'll happen. I mean, it's like uh, President Obama saying that there will be elimination of nuclear weapons, but not in my lifetime. So he could say that in Prague and, and just go away. But this is, more, this is more important because it's really tremendous waste and, um, and it's, it's eroding our scientific base, eroding uh, uh, our capability of doing other things. So in places like MIT, I've been doing this for uh, like three years, and, I've been, and Noam Chomsky and I did a talk uh, that uh, Radius, uh, uh, where 400 students came that time, and talking about Cold War science from Cold War to, um, to climate change. So people are getting uh, uh, aware of this very slowly, although I would think I would like to have some interest from this election cycle that we could at least brief some people and, and, and show what these, and we tried, uh, Elizabeth Warren, that not this cycle, last time, but I didn't succeed. So, um, so anyone has any connections, et cetera, bring this topic up and, uh, and the people, politicians should be, at least they should face these numbers and, um, uh, and even though they may not be able to change something right away, but um, anyway, so thank you for your attention and uh, coming, I'll stop so that we can have a discussion. Yeah, and you can, <laughs> thank you, thank you.